going to uh, kick off the uh, next session. I think it's the, the last one before the grand finale that is going to happen uh, downstairs. Um, my, my name is Matthias. Uh, I'm a, a partner at uh, Speed Invest, where I'm uh, managing our uh, focus fund, Speed Invest X. We are focusing on uh, investing in, in marketplaces uh, at seed stage in Europe and also in the US. And I have the honor to uh, interview uh, Oishin, I hope I pronounced that more or less correctly, um, <clears throat> from uh, Handy.com, founder and CEO of uh, uh, Handy.com. And yeah, uh, going to talk about how they have been navigating hyper growth and uh, uh, scaling the company um, over, over the years. And uh, yeah, maybe to, uh, first of all, great to have you and thanks for coming. Um, and uh, maybe to kick it off uh, would be interesting if you could give us a, a brief overview about the genesis of, of Handy, and uh, especially considering that you got recently acquired by, by IAC, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting story also for a lot of like younger marketplace founders here that, that still have that uh, most of the way in front of them. So we started Handy just under seven years ago to change how people buy and sell home services. So you think about all the services you need inside your home from handymen to cleaners to plumbers, electricians, carpenters, and it's typically a pretty clunky, messy, broken process to actually book those services. And it involves negotiating a price, trying to figure out the scheduling, are they free, are you free at the same time, what's the scope of work, what happens if something goes wrong, how do you take payment? Do they have insurance? Are they actually gonna show up and like take advantage of you and take all your money? And what we wanted to do was solve that for the customer. And what we realized very quickly was the same thing was happening for the pros. So there's millions and millions of small businesses who are going through the opposite side of that problem, which is how can I actually get more business? How do I not get taken advantage of by a customer? How do I ensure I get paid? How do I find work when I want? And what we realized was this problem was most acute in small jobs. So with large jobs, you want to get your whole apartment remodeled or you want to get your whole kitchen redone. It's actually like not a bad experience. Typically, there's a lot of problems in terms of like how to actually make sure that it gets done well. But the actual transaction experience itself, lots of people want that work because it's you know, 10, 20, 50, 100, $200,000 of work to actually go and renovate a whole house or renovate a whole apartment. What's really clunky is you want to get a ceiling fan put in or you want to get some furniture assembled or you want to get your place cleaned. And it's because the transaction costs are so high. So the actual act of organizing the job is almost in some cases more work than doing the job itself. And that's kind of how we started Handy, which was let's solve sub $500 home service transactions. So let's build a direct-to-consumer brand that takes away all the pain of those very small transactions, and let's make it so that you can buy them the same way that you'd buy a product. So let's try and go out and turn small services into products. And that was the genesis of Handy about, like I said, about seven years ago. We've scaled over the last seven years, and as, as you pointed out, we recently exited to Angie Home Services, which is part of IAC. Yeah, congratulations again. Thanks. Um, Maybe that's interesting to understand for people here also what actually makes Handy a, a double-sided marketplace. So it's actually interesting. Um, obviously, on one side, you've got pros. So when we first went out in 2011, I think or late 2000, May 2012, actually, we went out and we were testing the idea. We put up some ads for pros saying handymen wanted, cleaners wanted, plumbers wanted. And if you think back to 2012, the economy was in a very different place to where it is now. So unemployment back in 2012 was probably three times what it is today. So we would put up an ad and we would get thousands and thousands of applications like immediately. So we knew very quickly that the supply side of the market was there. Like they wanted work and they wanted it like really fast. When we went out and did some consumer marketing, some consumer testing, the response was okay. It wasn't like as overwhelming. Obviously, if the economy is a little softer, you're going to have that. Today, the situation is reversed. So today, if you think about it, it's much harder for us to acquire pros than it is to go and acquire, uh, acquire customers today. So th those are kind of the two sides of the market. We built a direct-to-consumer market probably for the first five years. 
in the last two years. Maybe sorry for interrupting, but just for for understanding, does it mean that the people were on your payroll, so that you uh, basically hired them and they were on your own payroll, or were they still contractors and and self-employed? We've we've always run a contractor model, so we've always run a contractor model for our pros. That means they set their hours, they set their availability, they claim jobs whenever they want. Uh, they can decide when to work. They can decide where to work. They can decide never to work. Uh, we standardize all of their onboarding, so we do a background check and we make sure that they're going to hit certain quality standards. But they're not on our payroll, so we've got you know tens of thousands of folks that are but not. But they on come payroll. in a handy look and feel, so to say. We set quality guidelines that they have to meet. It doesn't mean they wear a handy polo, but it means they'll wear a polo. So we set quality guidelines that we want our pros to meet, but it doesn't mean they're going to show up and be handy branded, if that makes sense. Um, but just to go back to the, the two sides of the marketplace, the first five years, it was just those two sides. It was the consumer and the pro. And about two years ago, we actually noticed something that was beating us over the head for the first three or four years. That we just, I don't know, we were blind to, which was so many of our customers were going somewhere else, buying product, and then coming to Handy for the assembly. So they were going to Wayfair, going to Walmart, going to pick any store, buying a table and chairs, buying a ceiling fan, buying a light fitting, buying an air conditioner, and then coming to Handy and being like, hey, can you install this? And they were pretty much telling us and pulling us for five years to say, hey, why don't you guys just integrate directly so at point of sale this problem can be solved? And we went, away, we went out about two years ago and started that part of the marketplace, which is almost like you can look at it as a B2B2C play, or you can look at it as like a third partner in, or a third side to the marketplace, which is now we work with you know, many, many retailers so that at point of sale, they actually offer handy services. So today, Wayfair is probably one of the best examples. Across hundreds of thousands of SKUs, you buy a product and right there at the point of sale, you can add installation assembly. And the transaction's processed and it's a pretty, like, it's a pretty amazing experience. Is, is that like a kind of, I think it's an interesting growth technique. That's why uh, I want to deep dive a little bit on it. Just uh, is that a, a kind of white labeling or do you uh, issue vouchers or any kind of um, uh, discounts or anything like that? Or how does it work in practice? So think of it like shipping where manufacturers and retailers are constantly in a world of tension to figure out like what price their products are going to be sold at. There's MAP, which is minimum minimum price that the manufacturer really wants the retailer to sell at. And the retailer has fewer and fewer levers to think about how to get the product to pull through. One of the things they can do is obviously offer free shipping. Another is offer free installation or assembly. So they can also discount it. They so can it's like subsidized it by them, actually. Yeah. It's across the board. We go to the retailer and we give them a nationwide price to install or uh, carry out assembly for a certain category of product. And they have free reign to do whatever they want. They can mark it up. They can you know, pass it straight through. They can subsidize it. They can give it away free. And we see people doing different things. And we see people, we see retailers doing different things across different customer sets. So, you know, for your best customers who have your credit card and are part of your loyalty program and pay you part to, you know, be part of whatever, uh, whatever the loyalty pro program of that particular retailer is, they may discount it 50, 60, 70 percent. But that's on their, on their dime, not on our dime. And it's always fully handy branded. So it's never a white labeled experience. It's always a handy branded experience. Can you can you reveal how much of your sales roughly that accounts for or like, is it very important uh, factor for you? So in a pre being part of a public company yeah. world? Yeah, I would just tell you everything. I'd just be like, Yeah, sure, I'll just tell you I would have no problem with it. But no, now I've gone through like 14 hours of training of like, <laughs> shit to say and shit not to say. Um, <laughs> Which was That's wonderful. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to the wonderful folks in HR and or PR and comms at uh, Angie. Um, no, so I can't tell you. But I can tell you it's significant. Um, and it's really, it's really a very, very, very solid customer experience. Because if you think through it, like, nobody wants to think about how to take their TV home, how to like, get the mount put in, how to make it sit on the wall properly, how to hide these like, cables that kind of look crappy here. Nobody wants to think about that. They just want to go home and watch Game of Thrones on a giant TV and eat popcorn. We take away all of that part in the middle by integrating with FedEx and UPS. We know exactly when it's going to be delivered. You pick any time of day you want. You watch the person arrive the same way you watch an Uber driver or a Lyft driver arrive. You have ultimate control on the experience. And it's one of the few categories, or it's one of the few times when 
you can actually get straight to the end experience of what you're trying to do, which is enjoy the product. Like people don't boast about buying product anymore. Like if you look at like the conversation that's happening on social, nobody talks about the product they're buying anymore. People talk about what they're doing with it. People talk about the experiences they're having. And service is such an important part of experience that it's like a real, like it's a real weapon for a retailer to sell more product if they get the experience right. And, and in return, would that bring you also uh, more business? Uh, in terms of demand that then those clients would also order other services? Yeah, so a lot of those a lot of those customers download the handy app to manage their experience. So yes, you're right. We make money when the installation actually happens and there is a good percentage of those people. Again, I can't tell you what percentage, um, but there's a good percentage of those people that actually convert over and become handy customers directly as well. We also see them across different retailers. So we see customers come in in one retailer, buy, end up with a handy service, then they'll go to a different retailer and attach another handy service. And like we can track that and we can know pretty, like. We can know a lot more about the customer than even in some cases the retailer because when we go to the home, so the person doesn't just put the TV on the wall or you know assemble the table and chairs and walk out. They take a photo of it. They take a, net, a wide shot and a narrow shot. It gets emailed to the customer. The customer gets it in their receipt. But that's all like data that we're collecting to know more about the customer. You probably see when someone is moving actually, like based yeah. on just what they buy and and what re what services they request. Well, you can see when people are moving, you can also just have so much more insight into how the customer is engaging with product. Like we have uh, the average e-commerce, I don't know who here is in e-com, but in the average e-commerce review collection rate is somewhere around one to 3% or one to 5%, depending on category and how passionate the category or how passionate users are about the category. We collect reviews on pros 75% of the time. We collect reviews on product about half that. So about 37, 35% of the time, so one in three, a little more than one in three, we're getting a review on the, on the retailer's product, which is like 10x better than what they're getting. So we know whether or not the customer is happy or unhappy with the product in a lot of cases before the retailer knows. So there's a whole opportunity to go and for the retailer to step in and say, hey, we know you're not happy with the product. How can we like try Do you to share that with them as well? Yeah. Yeah, well, it depends. In a lot of cases, yes. Um, yeah, in a lot of cases, yes. Let's talk a little bit about the supply side. Uh, how, how fungible is the supply actually? So, so can one handyman also deliver different kind of services or is it usually like very dedicated, very specialized? It depends. So the same handyman can put together, you know, one set of furniture and another set of furniture. But we do a lot of what we call um, specific client onboarding, which means for a particular retailer or a particular brand. So in some cases we work with the brand, in other cases we work with the retailer, we'll actually create dedicated content for that brand or for that retailer that is specific to how they want their customers to be taken care of, or in some cases specific to assembling that product. And if you haven't taken or consumed that content, then you can't assemble it. So, so it's like content for the handyman, for the pros to actually uh, kind of become certified to uh, deliver those services. Yep. Outside of that, there are all sorts of licensing and regulation require regulatory requirements for specific tasks that obviously if you're a licensed electrician and you're in Texas and you're not even in Texas, you're in like covering 200 zip codes in Austin, you can't go outside those 200 zip codes, or you can, but you can't do licensed electrical work, you can only do regular handyman work. So there's like a whole myriad of licensing that's like, welcome to yeah. <laughs> welcome to the lawyers in the room. How, how does that affect your supply acquisition actually? Because it must be horrible. I'm just imagining in across different states, trying to comply with that and trying to Look, local service is a super hard business. So home services is hard. Local home service is hard. Local home services across, you know, 50 states is like really a hard business. And I think once you've built a marketplace that works, once you've built something that's got liquidity, that's got volume, it's really valuable. And it's like really special. And it's actually all of the complexity that you're talking about, plus another hundred things, or maybe a thousand things that make it hard to be in this category. Like you look at it and you're like, hey, how hard can it be to build an app and get someone to show up and assemble some furniture? It's like, that can't be that hard. <laughs> Try doing it you know, millions of times and you realize it's the complexity is both in the volume and also the intricacy of all of the different uh, ways in which the, the volume has to be sliced. And it's actually interesting because um, how, uh, 
how much share of the wallet uh, of your um, pros do you actually have? Do you think because of that it's higher than, I don't know, for the average marketplace? Or do they do a lot of other business, so to say, next to Handy? So the average pro on Handy works somewhere between 15 and 20 hours a week on the platform. Obviously, there is a barbell. Some people work a lot. Some people work not a lot. Um, but that's where the average skews. Cool. So it seems pretty, uh, pretty significant in my eyes. Um, maybe on that note also what's interesting is then how do you prevent bypassing? So, I mean, people come there, they meet face to face. Uh, next time I just book the same guy without you. Yeah, it's possible. It's definitely a challenge. Um, I think you see it more in recurring categories. So you see it more in cleaning than in handyman yeah. services. Uh, we have a number of different things that we do. Obviously, we create incentives for the customer to stay in the platform. We have what we call flexible plans, which are three, six, and 12-month plans that the customer gets a discount when they sign up for. Uh, there's fees associated with bypassing. On the pro side, the more work you bring to the platform, the more work you get from the platform. So there are all of the, there are also the take rate changes. So there's all these different things that we do to incentivize staying take, the take rate changes in terms of uh, having to pay less when you deliver more business? Yeah. Okay, exactly. cool. Um, talking a little bit about the initial ticket of the uh, of the talk, actually, um, what has uh, enabled you or, or Handy to actually grow and scale uh, in in such a competitive space? Because you have, especially here in the US, you have a number of players that are either directly or indirectly competitive, right? Look, I go I go all the way back, and I kind of break the journey of marketplaces into three or four different phases. And I think the first phase is, does anyone give a shit? And that's like the, you can call a product market fit. For us, it's do pros care enough and do customers care enough? And our pros cared like 150% from the beginning and our customers cared like 75 to 90%. So it's like, okay, both sides of the marketplace care. And I think that you know a lot of seed stage companies, they're trying to figure that out. They're trying to figure out, okay, do enough people care about this to actually engage? Um, and I think for any truly valuable marketplace, you need both sides to care a lot and you need one side to be like infatuated in love with you. Like no matter what, I'm like bleeding for this thing. Um, so I think that's the first phase. I think the second phase in marketplaces is once you realize the market's big enough and once you raise any venture capital, you're immediately in a competitive category. So for us, it was home joy, get made, my maid, hipster maid, every freaking maid company on the planet suddenly had raised. Thumbtack? Yeah, pick Thumbtack. Yeah. Thumbtack for sure had suddenly raised a couple million dollars of venture capital and was out in the market. And at that point, I think that what's most important in that second phase is to define your like field of battle to be the smallest possible size and just dedicate everything possible to winning that. So for us, it was domestic home cleaning in 20 cities in the United States. And our other you know, competitors who'd raised comparable amounts of capital went out across seven countries. And at, so, at that point, you're just so diverse and you're so spread and you're so distracted that you can't deploy dollar for dollar what your competitors are deploying. Um, and for us, that was those 20 cities. And it didn't really matter. Like, I think at one point when you Googled HomeJoy, we'd offer to pay you a dollar to come and clean your home. It was just like absurd at the time. It was like, it made no sense, but it made sense to win the category because we knew that there was this flywheel of customers were driving bookings, bookings were driving pros, pros were driving availability, which was coming back around and driving bookings. Customers wanted to be on the platform with the most availability, pros wanted to be on the platform with the most jobs. And it was just simple math that they'd only travel like 15, maybe 20 miles. That sign says five more minutes left, got it. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, that was like this journey of like, okay, what do we need to do to outcompete and win in this category? And then at some point, and I think it's largely a function of the TAM, the total addressable market, venture enthusiasm, environment that you're in, you transition from growth at all costs to, all right, what's the business look like? And that's a whole other set of skills and a whole other set of muscle that you got to go build and develop, which is rationalizing your operations, figuring out how to like make the operations actually efficient, figuring out how to get 
you know, the work of 100 customer service agents down to five because you actually build it into the digital product and suddenly your customers are self-serving, they're rescheduling, they're canceling, they're handling their claims by themselves. And that's a whole other thing that probably took us, you know, that transition from phase two to phase three probably took us three years. And then on the other side of that, you figure out, okay. How do you realize when the right time is for that? Or what is it more the, like forced from the outside? So I think it, it is forced from the outside indirectly. But what forces you to do it is you realize the competition just isn't as aggressive. So once the competition isn't as aggressive, like you notice that you're no long, your competitors are no longer discounting as aggressively as they were. They're no longer bidding up your CPCs to be insane. They're no longer, you know, they're no longer parking a truck in front of where you're onboarding your pros saying, come work at Homejoy today and we'll pay you $500. And you're like, seriously, like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah, like there's all of these like signals that are coming to you. And of course your investors are saying, hey, that burn, what's going on? That looks pretty hot. Do we really need to run that hot? Um, and then the fourth phase is, uh, so you've gone through that rationalization. You actually have a business. You've discovered, okay, this thing works. And then you're looking at it saying, oh my goodness, like what are the opportunities? And that was for us, that was where we lifted our head up and finally realized, oh my God, this retailer thing could like reaccelerate our business in a massive way. And there's probably, you know, half a dozen other dimensions now that, you know, we're exploring and going into, which all have that ability to go and like build a really like, significant marketplace within Angie, within Home Advisor, and within Handy, all because we won the category for that specific thing and then actually had a strong business on the other side of it. Yeah. Oh, exciting. What it's a way more fun to do phase two. Phase two yeah. is like the <laughs> most fun phase. Let's uh, open it up for questions because I think we don't have much time left. So, uh... how did you think of uh, your unit economics on a specific transaction while you were in that phase two, where you were burning a lot of money, probably also on a transaction basis? How are you selling the story both to yourself, to your and base, to your investors in terms of we're going to be able to fix this, and we're going to be able to have profit out of this? So. I don't think it's about looking at it and being blind to it. I think that's a really, really stupid thing to do. So looking at it and saying, oh, it's not bad. We'll just look at GMV. We don't need to look at net rev. I think it's really important to be weirdly bipolar. So if you believe in the category and you believe that it's important to drive volume, you want to spend 95% of your time just focused on the top line number, which is how many transactions are we doing in our core markets? Separate to that, there's a whole other body of work which you need to do, is, which is looking at what's the retention of the customer. Is the customer staying with you through time? What do the ongoing long-term economics look like? And that means saying, okay, we know that we spend $40,000 or 58, I think the minimum salary in New York is now 58,000 for a customer service agent in New York. We also know that we can do that comparably in the Philippines for like seven and a half thousand dollars. So yes, it makes more sense for us to go and recruit these people here now to drive and win this category, but we also have a pretty solid way to reduce this cost by this much. And I think when you're doing both of those things together, it's like it requires you to be weirdly bipolar, which is, okay, let's spend the vast majority of our time in the team's effort growing the business, but once every week we're gonna sit down with you know the finance team and say, okay, do we still believe in our core hypothesis? And what are the things we have to believe to be true in order to eventually become profitable? One is speed and execution. The other one is optimization afterwards, right? Yeah. Exactly. There's one more question. But don't lie to yourself. That's like the, the, the key. So a question in the back. So I think we knew when we were no longer facing aggressive competition in domestic home cleaning that it was time to focus on optimization. And once we had a handle on the optimization part, that was when we broadened our like apparatus or broadened our horizon and said, all right, what else can we go do? And we didn't mean that we had to have accomplished all of the optimization because Obviously, it's you know a process, and in any sort of rationalization, like it takes time. But once we'd started on, and I think we were halfway through it, where we said, "Okay, we know this is going to work. Like we know that like there's another half a dozen product features that need to be built, but we know that this one is going to reduce claims by this much. This much is going to reduce cancellation rates. Like so, we we had a good, we had a high level of confidence of like how it was going to play out. In terms of the supply base, they're just different. Um, they're similar in terms of how we recruit them, 
they're different in terms of how they behave once recruited, if that makes sense. So they are much more likely to be sporadically engaged. So super engaged for four weeks, the, the, the handyman, but then they're likely to take a big job off platform, be gone for four weeks, but then come back as opposed to the cleaning, the cleaning folks, which are much more likely to be like steady Eddie doing 15 hours a week. One last one. Yeah. Okay. So we don't hire folks. We, um, we don't do that. What it required us to do is become more efficient in terms of how we were onboarding our pros. So in the early days, the end-to-end -end funnel, it didn't really matter because there were just so many people applying. Now it's like a very, very, very well-managed process. Like we monitor you know, how long it takes to turn a background check around down to the minutes because we know that the faster we can get the background checks turned, the faster we can onboard the people, the less likely they are to go somewhere else. So it's a very tight process now. Do you run like retraining programs, like getting people to become a... We don't do training. We partner with other organizations that help increase the supply base. But as a platform, we don't engage in training. Can I have just another question? Yeah, sure, go for it. It's transactional. Uh, it was transactional, 100% transactional until the um, until the acquisition. Now it's a much more complicated hybrid model. But it was, you know, you pay eighty dollars to get furniture assembled. We pay the pro sixty. We keep twenty. Round math. I don't know. Do we still have time or we one more? Okay. <laughs> So our marketplace was always that. So we, in the early days, we never let you pick anybody. Um, we let you change, but we didn't let you pick. So we would assign your pro to you. And if you didn't like that pro, as you, know, we got, as we, as you got closer to the job occurring, we would communicate to you who the pro was. And we did that because there was so much volatility in terms of the customer changing and the pro changing the time and canceling between when the job was scheduled and when the job was due to occur. So between date add and date start, there was like so much volatility that we actually created these shadow jobs where we would bundle all the jobs that were starting within, I don't know, an hour of now, within three miles of here into one job in San Francisco, in, I don't know, whatever area we're in. Um, and we'd say, hey, there's gonna be eight jobs that are gonna start around 5 p.m. We know that six of them are going to happen, two of them are going to get canceled, but we're going to overbook or underbook knowing that that's what's going to happen. So that was why we did it. As the platform became older, we noticed the customers had preference for particular pros, not so much on their first booking if they were straight new to the platform, but on their second booking for sure they would have preference, or if they were referred by a particular person who had a particular pro, then they had preference as well. So it became like much more complicated to manage how we delineated or didn't delineate whether we put you in a shadow pool or let you actually have selection. Did you have the press from lower then in 2012 for, for all this was happening, where they're sort of saying, like, here's a, you're not picking this person, and you're not seeing how smiley they are, and this is a mech, you know? I mean, because it's you would sh still show them someone, right? Basically, we would show them somebody after. Yeah. So we would show them somebody after they made the booking, but before the booking was due to occur. I think the biggest thing that's changed is people have become aware that they can engage with a platform to change who's coming. So we've noticed more and more people engaging with the change pro button more than anything else. The thing, the thing that drives conversion is uh, less whether we show the pro or not, more like whether you get the time you want. If you get the time you want, you're gonna buy. Um, that's why it's the network effect. Great, Thank you. thanks for having you and um, thanks for coming. And uh, now we have the closing remarks downstairs in the, in the main uh, room. Thank you. <laughs>